director, and it's going to be a movie and a Broadway show. Now, a movie thing. Now, I remember hearing uh, movie talk sometime around the summer. What's going on uh, with uh, the, the potential uh, development? Sure, they, we are uh, our executive producers are Barry Rosen and Mary Gleason with Triangle uh, Triangle Entertainment, and uh, the. Um, uh, they are in talks right now with directors, <laughs> and we're going to have a major announcement to make here very shortly about directors and about uh, screenplay and cast and the usual thing you have to go through. But uh, it's going to be about two years in the in the making, and it's going to we're in pre-production now, and it's going to be a Broadway show as well. Oh, excellent! And we're just flipped out the Nederlanders, who are oh probably the oh the the widest known in, oh, yeah. in, inside the industry of the uh, of the uh, theatrical families in the United States are bringing us to Broadway, and uh, so we're just flipped out about that. I I'm really amazed. Uh, the story itself, me, the mob, and the music, is uh, you know essentially an autobiography with uh, about two thirds of the book devoted to our very crazy and often dangerous relationship with Roulette Records. Roulette Records. Um, as well, most people know now who have read the book, but Roulette Records was, in addition to being a functioning record company, was also a front for the Genovese crime family in New York. And of course, we didn't know about any of that when we signed with the label. We found out incrementally. And um, uh, we had some real issues up there. I mean, it really, things really got very scary. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, none of the fans knew that this was going on, but uh, we really had to walk on eggshells. And, you know, the funny thing about it was that uh, uh, despite everything, I have very mixed feelings about it because, on one hand, it was, you know, it was horrible doing business with them, and it really, at, at, uh, Morris Levy, the head of the label. But on the other hand, if we had been with one of the corporate labels like CBS or RCA that we could have gone with, uh, we probably would have been handed to a producer and uh, lost in the numbers. And that's probably, especially with our first record being Hanky Panky, mm -hmm. that's probably the last time anybody would have heard from us. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it was a mixed blessing because we really... Uh, got the run of the place and we got to we, I got an education at roulette there's no way I would have had anywhere else mm -hmm. and yeah did you think honestly you know, you know playing the music uh, you know in your first band back in Niles Michigan that you would end up uh, being the hit maker that you became but also getting involved unintentionally in, into the world of organized crime it's right. just well, of course, we weren't involved directly, but no. I mean the the people who we were doing business with were. And, um, you know, this made life very interesting, to say the least, because it meant that the, all the all the goings on had a direct effect on us. And uh, uh, if I could just tell you that, uh, you know, I, we, we in the book, we go over it very, I try to be very fair about all this. Uh, you know, we, we started uh, the book, Martin Fitzpatrick and I started the book about eight years ago. And uh, we were going to write a nice music book called Crimson and Clover and write about the hits and then writing the songs and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, we really wanted to stay away from the, the topic of the mob. And, uh, but we got about a third of the way into it and looked at each other and said, you know, if we don't tell the whole roulette story, we're really cheating ourselves and everybody else. But we were very uncomfortable writing about this then because some of these guys were still walking around. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 06, basically the uh, the guys we felt uh, would co create problems uh, were had had passed away, and uh, we felt we could finish the book, so we did, and we started it and and finished the thing. It took us another three years to finish mm -hmm. and to do it properly. And uh, uh, Simon and Schuster uh, grabbed it right off the bat, <laughs> and almost immediately we started getting. Uh, request for the movie rights but you know the book itself really I, I am just amazed at the response of people because it seems to hit people a lot of different levels because it's not only about the you know the mobs involvement with rock and roll but it's about really inane stuff like what kind of guitar and amp I had when I first started <laughs> out we get quite I, I'm amazed at some of the the uh, the minutiae that people respond to because so many people who are in 
uh, the professions today started out with a cover band. Mm-hmm. Started out playing in in bands and in you know uh, high school and junior high school and you know back then it was an actual job opportunity. So I'm I'm really amazed how many at how many levels um, you know this this book communicates with people and I'm, I couldn't be happier. And you know and we the whole thing about how you you got your first taste of fame is just a a great story in itself. Uh, we're talking you know your recording of Hanky Panky and how it was almost left uh, for the scrap bin but if it weren't for uh, a a DJ in Pittsburgh of all right. places That's true. You, know, you know kind of saved you and, and really got you into the mainstream and kind of you know that was the great thing that got the ball, ball rolling Absolutely it was really a miracle. I was uh um uh, in fact, the longer I'm in this business, the more I realize uh, what a miracle this was. This was, uh, I had recorded Hanky Panky back in my hometown uh, with my cover band in, in high school. It was our, uh, we recorded it for a local DJ who started his own regional label. Jack Douglas was his name at WNIL, and he was starting a little label called Snap Records. And uh, Hanky Panky was one of the four sides that we recorded for him back in 1964. I was a, a junior in high school. And uh, so uh, we recorded Hanky Panky. It came out locally and, uh, you know, made a lot of noise locally, but we just couldn't get into it. We were right in the middle between Chicago on one side and Detroit on the other, and we were just in a dead zone, and we really couldn't make it happen. So the record kind of came and went. So I graduated from high school the next year in 65, took my band on the road, and we were playing Rush Street Clubs in Chicago and up through the Midwest, and uh, we're playing a little dumpy place in Janesville, Wisconsin. (laughs) And uh, uh, right in the middle of my two weeks, the IRS shuts this guy down. And so we were just feeling like total you know, lame brains, and we were we were going back to Niles, you know, broke and feeling depressed and very sorry for ourselves. And as soon as that's how the good Lord works, because as soon as we got home, I get a call from Pittsburgh that Hanky Panky, uh, uh, out of nowhere, this record that I had forgotten about, was picked up by a local DJ, played at a club, and. Uh, uh, was bootlegged and sold 80,000 copies in 10 days. Only in America. Yeah, exactly. Only in America. (laughs) And uh, we were sitting at number one. Mm -hmm. And I said, you're kidding. And and I just, you know, just out of the clear blue. So if we hadn't, you know, if the guy hadn't gone belly up in the middle of my two weeks, we wouldn't be talking here today. And so I, I went to Pittsburgh. I couldn't put the original band back together. So I went back to Pittsburgh. I went over to Pittsburgh, and sure enough, we're number one, and um, but only in the city of Pittsburgh. <laughs> you know, outside the city limits, I'm nobody. Mm-hmm. So I sort of grabbed the first bar band I could find and my first manager in Pittsburgh, and we head for New York. This is in uh, uh, April, May of of '66. And uh, so I think the the first week of May, we arrive in New York and we go around to all the record companies and we were so thrilled because we got a yes from everybody. Mm -hmm. Atlantic, Columbia, Epic, RCA, remember Kama Sutra Records? Oh yeah, oh yeah. And um, the last place we took the record to was Roulette. Mm -hmm. And um, so we were just thrilled because we knew we were probably going to go with Columbia or Atlantic and we uh, we were staying at the City Squire in New York and so we went to bed feeling great well the next morning we wake up and the phone starts ringing and one by one all the record companies call up and say listen we got a pass I said what do you mean you pass I thought we had a deal <laughs> yeah. and finally Jerry Wexler at Atlantic leveled with us and said Morris Levy from Roulette Records called all the other record companies and said this is my record back off Mm -hmm. and they did (laughs) and so we were apparently going to be on roulette records and that began all this and you know we went there and we signed and didn't realize what we were getting ourselves into you know they they were truly a a mob finance label and 